Welcome to Moments with Marianne. Allow me to interrupt your train of thought with something that may be one of the most interesting things you hear today. This is Marianne Pastana, and we have two very special guests for you today. Our first guest today is Alka Josie, and she's here to share with us her new novel, The Secret Keeper of Japur. Now, Alka was born in India, and she's lived in the U.S. since she was nine. She earned her B.A. from Stanford University and an M.F.A. from California College of the Arts. Her first novel, The Henna Artist, was an instant bestseller. Today, we're going to be sharing the second book of her trilogy, The Secret Keeper of Japur. So let's welcome to the show, Alka Josie. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be back with you again, Marianne. I guess it's been about a year, right? It has. It has. You know, and I was looking at our last time that we got together and talked about The Henna Artist which is one of my favorite books. And when I got hold of this book, ooh, couldn't put it down. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know what's interesting is that my publisher had bought the sequel about six months before the henna artist was even uh, in the stores. And so that's how much confidence they had had in the ability of the henna artist to be a bestseller. They thought, okay, you know, we're going to make good on the henna artist. So we're going to buy this sequel. They bought it on the strength of 20 pages. So it seems as if I have written and published a book in just one year after the henna artist, but it's actually been a few years in the making. Oh my gosh. Well, I am so glad because there's so many people that had questions you know, about like, okay, what happened to these characters? So for our listeners that may be new to the henna artist, which I would, you know, I'd be surprised if there are many because your (laughs) book's a bestseller everywhere. Why don't you share a little bit about that story? Because I think it will help people to understand the next story we're going into. Yeah. I wrote The Henna Artist for my mother. I wanted to imagine a life for her that was so different from this conventional Indian arranged marriage, have three children in the first four years, uh, don't get an education kind of life that she had. Uh, She always granted me a far more independent life than she had been given. So I thought, you know, maybe I can create a fictional character to give her that life where she can forge something on her own. Uh, So the the idea of Lakshmi, the henna artist, was born. Lakshmi is 30 years old when we meet her in the henna artist. For the last 13 years, she has been uh, applying her trade as a henna artist and an herbalist. She is mysterious to the ladies whom she services because they don't know anything about her background and they are loath to ask her, having assumed that she had a husband who had abandoned her. In reality, she abandoned her marriage 13 years ago so that she could live uh, her own life, so that she could navigate the patriarchy on her own terms and uh, do the kinds of things that she'd always wanted to travel the world, to see more people, to experience what it's like to be inside these uh, elite, uh, you know, Japper homes and so on. And so that is what she's doing. But as we uh, enter her, Lakshmi's world, she there is a knock on her door. And it is that estranged husband whom she did leave behind in a village 13 years ago. And he brings with him a sister whom she didn't know she had, a sister who is now 13 years old and uh, is needing to be taken care of. So suddenly, Lakshmi, who's been living this very free ranging life, is saddled with, uh, you know, a husband that she somehow has to try to explain to people. uh, And and then also this sister whom she has to take care of. So um, it is a life that is filled with obstacles. And now we are on this journey to try to figure out how is Lakshmi going to handle these new challenges in her life? And how is she going to develop as a person as a result of them? Well, do you know, I, I had those same questions. <laughs> I'm sure many of your readers did. And I, I, is that the reason why you came out with this new book is that, you know, people were just clamoring to see, gosh, what happened? Well, not necessarily, because, um, you know, what happened is that Malik, who was Lakshmi's eight-year-old helper in The Henna Artist, and a very um, adorable presence in her life, uh, sort of completing her, uh, you know, her yin to his yang, you know, kind of thing, Um 
he started bugging me in my imagination saying, you've got to write my story now. As it turned out in the henna artist, I had had about 150 pages that did not make it into the final version of the book. I had done about 30 drafts of the henna artist before it was published. So there were so many passages, so many scenes, so many backstories that had not made it into the final version. And I knew exactly what was going to happen to Malik and to Radha as they grew into adults that uh, I wanted to include and I wanted to write stories about. So Malik said, why don't you start with me? Start with my story. So that's what I did in The Secret Keeper. I had started his story. It was all about the fact that he is now 20, living in Shimla uh, with Lakshmi and Dr. Kumar. And he has uh, completed his boarding school education. He has turned from a waif, uh, which he was in The Henna Artist on the Streets of Jaipur, to this very polished young man. And Lakshmi wants to send him down to Jaipur uh, to be an apprentice at the palace. So it's a whole different kind of world for him. What I wanted to find out was, has he changed? If he's changed from the outside, has he also changed from the inside? And then I also wanted to explore How does Lakshmi feel about having been a guardian to him all of these years, having been his mother figure? How does she let go of his, the management of his life? Just as any parent struggles to let go of their adult children and to stop telling them exactly what to do with their lives. So I wanted to know how is Lakshmi handling that separation? And then I realized that Malik now has a love interest. And uh, how is Lakshmi feeling about that? Is this the kind of wife or girlfriend that she imagined for Malik? All of these things are things that I wondered about uh, when I was writing The Henna Artist. And that's why I had originally written this sort of future scenario that did not make the cut in The Henna Artist. And now I get to tell everybody about it in The Secret Keeper of Jaipur. (laughs) Oh, I'm so glad that you've written this book. And it's interesting because, you know, like Moloch, like any young person, I mean, if we don't keep them busy, they're going to get into trouble. (laughs) Yes, that's it. Exactly. (laughs) And Lakshmi is trying really hard to make sure that Moloch is on a straight path and that he does not stray. You know, he is such an enterprising person that even while he was at Bishop Cotton, the boarding school that he went to in Shimla, he was constantly procuring things for his classmates in return for money. This is how he was making like an extra little income. He seems to be a really good businessman and he cannot help himself uh, from getting into these sort of illegal activities. He's he's procuring uh, whiskeys and cigarettes and porn and all these things that that the boys at Bishop Cotton are wanting. And so Lakshmi thinks to herself, I have got to make sure that he grows up right and that he has a profession that he can rely on for the rest of his life. I'm going to send him down to Jaipur and work with the palace uh, construction facilities and, uh, you know, with the Maharanis and sort of a better class of people. (laughs) But in the end, guess what happens? He does inadvertently uh, step right into the middle of an underworld that she had tried to keep him away from. And that underworld leads him right back to uh, Shimla, to his beloved, and to Lakshmi. (laughs) That is too funny. It's amazing how that story just wraps together. I mean, when I was reading, I was just amazed how all that came back together. It kind of made my mind hurt a little bit, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Well, and, you know, it's interesting when we talk about, like, secrets, So Malek was, he was like privy to some secrets. Why, why was that? He is privy to, uh, he is privy to so many secrets because uh, he was with Lakshmi the whole time that she was in Jaipur. He is going to these homes. He is always on the sidelines listening to the conversations. So he knows exactly um, who had a child out of wedlock. He knows uh, which uh, husbands are sleeping with another mistress. He knows where Lakshmi's been and whom she has had uh, conflicts with. So he has a lot of secrets that he is keeping because that's just who he is. A good businessman always uh, keeps uh, you know, confidential information to himself unless he needs to use it 
to further his cause. So that is exactly what Malik is doing here. But you know what's interesting is that I do not come up with the titles of my books. My publisher does. I am a lousy title person. And so <laughs> I let my publisher determine the titles. They came up with the henna artist and uh, they came up with the secret keeper of Japur. And when I saw that on the list of titles they were proposing, I said, oh, that one sounds good because Malik is keeping secrets while he's in Japur about all of these families that he's encountering again 12 years after he has left Japur. Now, um, what was interesting to me is that I had a book club where we were all talking about The Secret Keeper. It was one of my early book clubs because uh, the sequel was only released two months ago, and it was one of the first book clubs I had. And they said, you know, Malik is not the only secret keeper in this book. Lakshmi is a secret keeper. Uh, the Singhs are keeping secrets. Uh, Manu and Kanta are keeping secrets. The Maharanis are keeping secrets. And also uh, Motilal, the jeweler, is keeping secrets. And Hakim is keeping secrets. So actually, you should have called this book the secret keepers of Jaipur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to say Lakshmi, I and mean, she's got a lot of secrets that she keeps from a lot of different people because of the work that she does. And she's so well recognized as being the top henna artist. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, in the um, in the henna artists, Lakshmi was very good at keeping the confidences of these women, which is why they confided in her. They knew that she wasn't a tattletale. She wasn't going to rat on them about the the, you know, sort of the more embarrassing parts of their lives. Um, and so she was prized uh, not only as a henna artist, but as a healer, somebody who was helping them realize their desires and their hopes. Now, by the time we reach the secret keeper of Japur, she is now a full-blown herbalist, and she is using her knowledge of the plant-based medicines that she applied in the henna artist. Uh, now she is growing her healing garden at the community hospital in Shimla, and uh, she is uh, working at the community clinic alongside Dr. Kumar so that she can help the ind indigenous people who really like the herbal medications more than they like the uh, sort of Western medicine that smells funny to them. And so she has actually changed her profession. She has gone back to healing people, which is exactly what her mother-in-law had taught her all those years ago uh, when she lived in a small village. So, um, yeah, she is uh, keeping secrets. She is able to keep secrets. And when she comes down to Jaipur to help Malik unravel the big mystery that he is trying to unravel, uh, she uses some of those secrets, I think, to get leverage, to, to get people to cooperate with her. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> you know, and um, one of the things that I know the book kind of goes into is a little bit of the significance of gold in the Indian culture. And I'd love for you to kind of expand on that for us. You know, I don't think that I have read, ever run across a South Asian woman who does not wear a pure gold chain around her neck. We're talking about 22 carat, 24 carat, or she's wearing a slew of gold bangles on her wrists, probably something that was given to her at her wedding and she has never taken those off. Uh, or she's got rings on her fingers that are pure gold probably studded with some kind of jewel that her astrologer or a yogi has recommended for good fortune. And uh, so I've always been very curious, why is 22, 24 karat gold in India considered such a uh, sort of everyday necessity? In the West, you know, we do 14 karat gold, we do 18 karat gold, we rarely do 22 to 24 karat gold. It's a very soft metal once it gets to be more pure like that. And, uh, you know, it can get misshapen. But in India, it's always been prized. Now, gold is the standard of money. Money, right. So uh, it throughout the world. And so what Indians think is that if they convert their paper money into gold, it never loses its value. The gold will always be there. You know, it can't melt away. Uh, it's hard for people to steal, you know, mountains of jewelry from your neck. Uh, and so uh, women choose to wear their gold uh, always and to show people this is how much I'm worth. So I always just found that whole concept so interesting because it's such a different concept from the West. 
Um, and so uh, I wanted to explore this a little bit more. As I dug deeper into India's gold, I realized so little of the gold is actually mined in India, and yet everybody in the world is wearing it there. So I thought, where is it coming from? And in my research, I found out it's coming from Africa, it's coming from South America, it, it uh, flies into Dubai, and then it is dispersed throughout the northern border of India especially in 1969, which is when the secret keeper of Jaipur takes place. And traffickers will bring it down all the way through the mountains and into the northern India area. Now, how do traffickers carry that much contraband, not only gold, but guns and drugs? How do they carry that much through these very high, very treacherous mountains? Remember, Mount Everest is up in the Himalayas. It's, it's really cold and it's high elevations up there. So not everybody can traverse those mountains. Well, what I found out is that traffickers are using some of these nomadic tribes to carry the gold down. They will either pay these tribes or they will um, actually threaten them with their livelihood, with their lives and with their families to carry the contraband for them down these mountains across the border. So the tribes will bring it down so far and then it will be carried uh, after that by, uh, you know, a relay team that, uh, you know, will disperse and send it down even further into the country. So I read this tiny little piece about uh, how sheep are sometimes used by these uh, nomadic tribes to carry gold or to carry the contraband. And I thought, well, how are sheep used? You know, how, how can you carry something on a sheep and not have it be found? And then I started really researching sheep. And uh, I got into these sheep shearing videos that I was watching on YouTube. You know, this is where all the rabbit holes that your research will take you down. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so I'm watching sheep shearing videos. And this idea comes to me, I thought, oh, now there's a way that you could carry gold and I won't give it away. But I just thought, wow, this is very interesting. So um, that is how in my uh, eyes, the gold is being carried from the borders, uh, northern borders of India, down through the mountains, and then it goes into the Shimla area where Lakshmi and Dr. Kumar are. So, you know, it's, it's just <laughs> India's gold um, was uh, prized for so many years. They ran out of all of that gold. Now they carry it in from other countries, but half of it is sold legally and half of it is sold under the table because there is such a high duty on gold coming into India that nobody wants to pay the full prices. And also they're limited. The jewelers are limited uh, uh, for the amount of gold that they can carry and sell. People, families are limited in the amount of gold that they can hold in reserve. Uh, and the government is concerned that the more gold people are hiding in their homes, uh, the rupee is getting devalued as a result. So there is uh, the India Gold Control Act, which has to be renewed every five, 10 years. And uh, the idea behind it is that you can only have so much gold legally sold in the country, which, of course, creates this huge black market in India. And that is where the secret keeper of Jaipur's, uh, you know, main storyline lies. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, because it's quite intense how all that comes together. I mean, it just doesn't affect you know, from a cultural standpoint, but also financial. I mean, you look at how uh, so the country is, is just running. And, you know, my goodness, I love how your books have all this inspiration of Indian food. Why is that so important to you? I, I, I was like, oh, there's some good recipes I've got to try out now. <laughs> Remember all those years ago when the European explorers were going across the north of India, what they were looking for was the spice route because India's spices are legendary. The spices we use in our food uh, not only add to the flavor of the food, but they are in there because they are so beneficial for your body. 
They are beneficial for your skin, for your bones, for your muscles, for your well-being, uh, for your mental well-being as well. So, you know, spices like cardamom and clove, they calm the body. Uh, spices like turmeric get rid of inflation inside the body and outside the body if you have a cut or a scrape. We in South Asia, we all grow up with the knowledge of what these spices can do. And there are so many home remedies where the spices are used. So uh, it's only natural for me to talk about the spices, not only as herbal cures, but uh, in the foods that my characters are eating. And I love Indian food. I don't know very many people who don't like Indian food because it is so tasty that I just have to put it in my uh, narrative, you know, as these characters go about their daily business, of course, they're going to be eating. And so now I get to decide, oh, what are they having for breakfast? What are they having for lunch? What are they having for dinner? And then I think to myself, what am I having for dinner? Oh, my gosh, I'm so hungry right now. I have to eat now. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of felt that same way when I was looking at the potato, cauliflower, pea, curry, vegetable. <laughs> oh, yes. The recipe that's in the yeah. back of the secret keeper. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that was one of my mother's signature dishes. She loved to make it and we loved to eat it. We would always ask for it whenever we came home. Now, my dad is also a great cook, by the way, and he cooks his very differently from the way my mom cooks it. Uh, my mom cooked it with um, more water. So it, it, it was more um, juicy. And my father cooks it in a very dry way. So you can cook this particular vegetable so many different ways. You can add for uh, into the potatoes and the cauliflower, you can add peas, or you can add carrots, or you can add tomatoes, you can add all kinds of different things. It's a very healthy vegetable, you eat it with rice, or you can eat it with chapatis. Or uh, in the West, I suppose you can go out and buy some pita bread, which is available everywhere. And that Middle Eastern bread is very close to how we eat our chapatis. Well, that stuff is just perfect. I love the recipes and I've tried a couple of them out over the years. I'm like, <laughs> Ooh, what's in this one? And it has me thinking, I mean, cause with every story we, we get to a place where of course people are going to have more questions. You know, it's like, especially when the secret keeper of Jaipur comes to this ending, are you working on another book? Absolutely. Because I tried to put a both, uh, Malik's and Radha's stories in The Secret Keeper of Jaipur. And Radha is, of course, uh, the 13-year-old sister who showed up in The Henna Artist at Lakshmi's door. Now, of course, she's a grown woman. She is several years older than Malik, but she has her own life. And um, as I tried to shoehorn her into The Secret Keeper, I realized that Malik's story is too rich, too big. I cannot also include her here. So she deserves her own book. So the third book that I'm writing in the Jabber trilogy is about Radha. And Radha is now, uh, the year is 1974, 75, somewhere right around there. Radha is now 30, the same age that Lakshmi was when she first had to incorporate a younger sister into her life. Now Radha is going to be confronted by the baby she gave up in The Henna Artist, the baby who was only four months old at the time. Uh, he got adopted by someone, right? And uh, he has accidentally found out that he is uh, that he was adopted all those years ago, and he wants answers from Radha. So he has come all the way up to Paris, where Radha now lives. Uh, she works for a fragrance house. She's a perfumer. She is on the cusp of designing the signature scent for her boss when there's a knock at the door, and on the other side is is Nikki, uh, the 18 year old, uh, who now wants answers from his birth mother, Radha. Oh my goodness. I can't wait to read that <laughs> one. <laughs> now, please tell me there are recipes in that one as well. Oh, there will absolutely be recipes. And also, I think with each one of these books, Marianne, what I'm trying to do is to show people a different part of India. So um, in The Henna Artist, I'm trying to show people about all of our herbal remedies, the remedies that are still practiced today, and the way that South Asians are able to incorporate the East and the West into their well-being, into the way they take care of their bodies. I'm also uh, showing everybody about the art of henna and why why it is practiced in India, why it is such an important part of a woman's self-care. In The Secret Keeper of Jaipur, I want to inform the world about India's gold culture, 
And of course, how uh, Indians also just live on a day to day basis, like everyone else, grappling with the same kinds of issues about parents and adult children and, uh, you know, beloveds who may or may not uh, end up with a partner that they're interested in and, you know, buildings that collapse and so on. Um, And then in the third book, Uh, about Radha, I'm trying to tell everybody about the fragrances that are mined in India, that are produced and manufactured in India. So many of the base oils that go into perfumes these days, and that have gone into perfumes over the centuries, are uh, from India. So for example, sandalwood oil is almost in every perfume that uh, you put on your body. Um, Vetiver, tuberose, these kinds of heavy oils are all uh, from tropical areas in the south of India. And so I want the world to know and appreciate so much of what South Asia has given to the West. And I want India to be recognized and appreciated for everything that that rich culture contributes to the globe. I just don't think that that appreciation is currently there. So I just want my books to very gently put uh, those kinds of facts forward. Well, I so appreciate your books. It's probably been, um, I I know with the henna artist and also the secret keeper of Japor, it's been, these books are books where I pick up and I can't put them down until I finished reading the whole one. And then I'm waiting for the next. (laughs) You know, know, I, I love books like that too. So I like to write books like that because I want to be so immersed in the, the, the setting and the characters of a book that I'm reading that I'm finding it hard to put it down. And every night when I get into bed, I am so looking forward to continuing the journey. So, um, you know, I, I want to write the kinds of books that I want to read. So many people ask me, did you have an audience in mind when you wrote your book? And um, did you want to tailor the story to a certain audience? And I always say, I'm the audience. I'm the person who is the audience for these books. I want to read these books because I'm interested also in these characters. I don't even know what's going to happen till the end until I get to the end as I'm writing it. So (laughs) I am just as surprised as everybody else when a character does something or says something that I, as an author, go, oh, my gosh, well, isn't that interesting? Let me follow that and see where that leads me. Uh, so I just, I, I love the characters of these books. I'm always so sad when the book is over and I, uh, and I'm happy again when I get to write about them again. So after, after the trilogy is over, I'm wondering, um, what I'm going to do next, but I think by then the TV series is going to be filming, uh, for the henna artists and I will hopefully get to go to Jaipur for that. So fingers and toes crossed that everything goes okay and that we will be filming the uh, Henna Artist TV series in late 2022 or early 2023. Oh my goodness. Well, congratulations. I've always <laughs> felt that the, your books should be definitely if not a movie, you know, how you talked about a series. I can't wait. So as soon as those become available, we'll have to talk. (laughs) Yes, yes, absolutely. And I'll and I'll tell you the behind the scenes, uh, you know, that I'm experiencing, because that's really where I'm going to be. I'm just behind the scenes. I am merely a fly on the wall when these things are going to get produced. Uh, But what an adventure it's going to be, Marianne. What an adventure my life in my 60s has been. It is it is amazing. My life has been an adventure the entire time. Uh, You know, I've I've had the opportunity that my mother did not have to work and live and have my own business in all these different countries. It's been amazing. Uh, And now in my 60s, oh, my gosh, here's another chapter of my life. I'm a full-time author. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> well, hold on, because pretty soon you could have a movie in there as well. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. I mean, we could talk forever. I just love your work. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about everything you're going to do? One of the joys of becoming an author has been to touch the lives of more than 6,000 people this last year virtually on, uh, you know, Zoom or one of these other uh, streaming 
platforms. Uh, I have done now 542 book clubs, which uh, just in the last year and a half, which has been just phenomenal. It's been so much fun for me to talk to people all around the world. So uh, the way that they have gotten a hold of me is they go to my website, alkajoshi.com. So easy. It's just my name.com. And they can always find my uh, email there. And they write to me directly and they say, hey, Alka, will you come join our book club? Hey, Alka, we've, we're a library and we'd like you to have, you know, come and speak to our patrons. Hey, Alka, you know, we have this literature festival going on. Will you please come and make a presentation? So I am open to any and all of those kind of opportunities. Because Marianne, as you know, during the pandemic, so many of us uh, had our our book launch is canceled. And so I've never had a book launch. <laughs> and it's been fun to do all of this virtually with everybody. Uh, so I look forward to every opportunity to connect with readers. Oh my gosh. You know, you mentioned that. That's right. Because when we were talking about the henna artist, the pandemic had kind of picked up and everything was changing. Oh my goodness. You know, but what a great world we live in where we can do things virtually and yeah. be a part of more things. And I think that we could have before. So, you know, I'm looking forward to your next events. You know, Alka, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. You're so welcome, Marianne. I have had such a good time. Well, thank you, Alka. It's always such an honor to spend time with you and to talk about your new books. Again, if you'd like to connect with Alka, you can at alkajosie.com for more information. Our next special guest today is Christy Hugstead, and she's here to share with us her new book, Be You Only Better, Real-Life Self-Care for Young Adults and Everyone Else. Christy's husband committed suicide in 2012, and since then she's dedicated her life to help abolish the stigma of mental illness and suicide. Christy is a certified grief recovery specialist and a grief and loss facilitator for recovering addicts at South Coast Behavioral Health located in Orange County, California. So let's welcome to the show, Christy Hugstead. Thank you so much for having me. What an honor it is to have you here to talk about your new book. I know we've had you on the show before to talk about your other books and gosh, you've got some great ones. Why don't you share with us what inspired you to write this one? Well, I've been focused so much in the past few years about suicide prevention and education. And then I, then I realized, you know what, I need to get some information out there about how to care for yourself so you don't get to that place of depression and anxiety and you need professional help. So that's when I came up with the idea of writing a self-care book for young adults and everyone else. Well, initially, as you know, my husband completed suicide eight years ago. And my initial response to that was, I need to educate people about the risk factors and warning signs of depression, mental illness, and suicide. And after a few years went by, I realized, you know... Young adults and everyone, we need tools, self-care tools that we can use throughout our lifetime to care for ourselves, to be responsible for our own mental health so that we don't reel into a depression, so that we ward off that that anxiety. So that's what inspired me to write a self-care book. Well, I'm so glad that you did. My goodness, what a great book it is. And as you know, gosh, like right now, everyone needs a little bit of self-care. And you think that this pandemic has really kind of shaped that for us? Oh, absolutely. You know, especially our youth, they didn't have self-care tools before the pandemic. And then to go through all the isolation, loss of social connection with their peers, uh, Online, everything's online. There's studies, you know, that is a lot, a lot for a young adult to handle. So the pandemic has just made our the mental health for our youth uh, even worse. Yeah, it seems like, you know, just everyone's going through that. Our youth especially are being 
just, I mean, they're just having such a time with that. And so how do you feel that self-care really affects wellness? Well, you know, we talk so much about physical self-care. And, you know, if you broke your leg, you wouldn't crawl into bed for a couple of weeks and hope that it healed. You just wouldn't do that. You would immediately seek a doctor. You would seek a medical attention. And that's not what's happening with our mental self-care. You know, we may crawl into bed for a couple of weeks and hope it goes away, but it doesn't work like that. So this, these tools and these, this skill set needs to be taught at a very young age. I don't know about you, but I had never heard the term self-care, you know, until I was in my thirties. So imagine if we had had these tools growing up, if we knew what to do to switch our brains and to make ourselves feel better and to be able to rely on ourselves for our own mental uh, self-care. That, that's an amazing thing. Well, the great thing is, is we're never too old to learn this. <laughs> you know? yeah. You're right. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember them talking about self-care growing up. It was like, you know, is the age of pretty much, you know, how you can just do as much as possible. Right. It's just schedule more, be more ambitious, you know, more is better. And um, so you're right. That's how we grew up and that's not healthy and that's got to change. Well, thank goodness for that. (laughs) So (laughs) I know you start your book just by talking to people about how we need to start writing things down. Why is that a really important thing? Well, when you start building the habit of journaling, you start to actually make things real when you write it down. You're validating, you know, this is what I'm going through. Your emotions, your feelings are there in front of you. And we all need those emotions validated. So that's why it's so important to write it down because it makes it real. And I know for me, when I started journaling, after six months, I looked back And I was so astounded at how far I'd come. I didn't even know that woman that I was six months ago. So it also really helps you chart your progress and realize, you know what? You are moving forward in in the journey of life. So validate your emotions and feelings. Put them in front of you so you can come up with a plan. I like how you look back and say, hey, look at all the stuff I've accomplished. It really makes you feel like you've been able to move forward. Yes. And you lose sight of that. You know, in your mind, most of us have the same thoughts that loop over and over again. I'm not working fast enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not spending enough time with my kids. You know, I'm not getting my schoolwork done, not spending time with friends. So when you journal and you write it down, you realize you know what? My life is more balanced than I thought. And it's really important to track that. So as we talk about self-care for teens, I mean, what does that look like? How can we get them involved so that they're practicing this and it's part of their routine? Well, I think the most important you speak of how can we get involved? And that's why in the subtitle, I put real life self-care for young adults and everyone else is I think it's really important for adults, parents, teachers to role model these behaviors. These self-care tools apply to everyone. And so if let's say you, you have these practices intact on a daily basis, your kids are gonna notice that. If you are sitting at your computer for four hours in a row and you stand up and say, wow, I have been sitting here so long, I feel terrible. My blood sugar is low. I haven't eaten. I'm going to go outside and go for a walk. You are role modeling that behavior. And so as a parent, an adult, a teacher, an administrator, that it's so important for you to practice these self-care tools as well and serve as a role model to our young people. I like how you said that it's for others as well, because I mean, again, you know, we have generations who have never even heard this word before, and to be able to start, you know, developing these habits into their life. I mean, how empowering is that? Well, and also, 
I'm getting more feedback from parents and teachers that say, I I didn't know that. Nobody ever taught me that. I needed this book and I needed to implement these self-care tools into my life. So I'm really glad I did that because I think it's important for all of us, young, old, whatever your profession is, we all have interaction with young people and we all need to get on the same page. Yeah, without a doubt. My goodness, you know, because it's, I mean, they're just going to be so much further ahead learning all this. And, you know, I know that you are always so precise with what you write. Was there anything that surprised you when you're doing your research for this book? Well, I think one of the more surprising things was the effects of lack of sleep. And that's why more important chapter book, because when you don't have adequate sleep, after a couple days, actually will start hallucinating. And that's why I think it's important for young people to realize, hey, you stay up the night before an exam and you don't sleep because you're cramming all night, you are not going to perform well the next day. And here's why. Here's what happens to your brain. Because I know for me in college, that's how I studied the night before. And I just want people to understand the brain science behind what happens when you don't take care of these areas in your life. So the sleep, I think, was the most eye-opening. Just that one thing could really change so much. Well, yes. And if you if you slept, you don't have any energy. You're not going to exercise. Uh, more easily depressed. I mean, it's kind of a domino effect that starts with sleep. You're not going to want to journal. You're not going to want to get out of nature. So your mood is going to be altered, which affects every area of your life. Now, you often hear people say, well, do you know what? If you're doing self-care, that's really selfish. What are your thoughts on that? Mm, It's about the most unselfish thing you can do. Because if you're not taking care of first, you cannot be there at your best for anybody else. You know, it's like the flight attendants telling you to put an oxygen mask on first. If you're struggling for air, you can't be of service to others. So it's not selfish and it needs to be a priority. So I know a lot of families right now, it's kind of a hot topic to discuss mental health and wellness. So how can families really incorporate this? Well, you know, it takes several hundred times of doing things routinely for it to become a habit. So I think the most important thing is family members to get on the same page, read the book, discuss what's out and what was important to them, and then implement those changes into their daily routine so it becomes a habit. So let's say, for example, you have been working and you come home and your kids are starving and you whip up an unhealthy meal and then a dessert that's loaded with sugar. You know, I've got an old chapter in there about the effects of sugar. So that's not being on the same page as what I'm trying to teach our young people. You example, you, you, you start conversations like, remember that sugar chapter, how, one can of cola has 10 teaspoons of sugar and then it becomes addicting. And pretty soon you're having four or five cans of soda. You know how much sugar that is in one day? I mean, it, it's disgusting. So you can't come home and fix a sugar laden meal for your family when all of you know that the most important thing you can change about your diet is to cut back on your sugar. So I think the family who call each other out and do this as kind of a family project. That sounds really exciting because then you have some support in being able to kind of, you know, watch what's happening that just furthers our self-care. Well, absolutely. And that's why at the end of each chapter, you know, I know as a, as a, a, an educator, you can tell people you need to journal, you need to meditate. You need to get out in nature. You need to do all these things to take care of yourself. 
but back that I would get, and, and I feel this way too as an adult, well, how do I do that? You know, you can tell me to drop my sugar and what the effects of sugar are doing to my health. So I have a sugar log at the end of that chapter. All right, what, let's, everything you ate that consumed, that had sugar. And then at the end of the day, you tally that. So I'm, I'm making you accountable. Or to say, you need to start journaling. Well, how do I do that? Do I need to go out and buy a journal? Can I use my phone? Can I use my laptop? Here's how to get started journaling. Here are some journaling prompts, some questions to ask yourself to get started. So I think one of the important things about self-care is that I included at the end of each chapter, here's how to get started. Here's what to do. Rather than just telling somebody, you know, you need to get out in nature. Well, why and how do I get started? Yeah, I mean, I really liked the getting ready for bed checklist, you know, and I think you know, just looking at, put your phone down 30 minutes before bed, that, that must be a hard one for some people. I think that's a hard one for everybody. You know, uh, it's not just our young people that are on their phones 24 seven. Most of us are tied to technology, but you don't know what a huge difference it makes to disconnect of like an hour, a half hour before you, you're, you want to go to sleep because it calms down your central nervous system. So they may seem simple and basic, but they work. Yeah. I mean, that's so, it, I think so many people are kind of missing out in being able to really connect with nature because I think, gosh, that feels so good when you're able to go for a walk and just be. Well, yes. And a lot of studies that have been, you know, our studies of people in urban areas to take that same route and work and it's all free or when they take a different route when they're in nature and really what is brain chemistry and it actually starts to change the chemical in your brain and make you feel better. And that's what self-care is all about. Well, we got to love that. We all want to get to a place where we're feeling better, especially in today's environment. I know there's so many people coping. It's, it's everywhere we turn and why all of these self-care tools are designed to work together. Like I mentioned, if you don't get enough, it's going to affect your exercise, your energy level, affect your mood. So you're not going to want to, you know, get out in nature. You're not going to want to be grateful. So the, there's a connection between all of them. And as you start reading through the book, you realize, okay, I've had an adequate night's sleep. I feel strong. I've eaten healthy food regularly. My blood sugar is stable. I've gotten out and gotten, you know, had some fresh air and enjoyed nature, the sounds and those around me. And all of these things change your brain chemistry. And that's what self-care is about. Upping those endorphins and all those neurochemicals in your brain. And you can do that yourself naturally. Through all the work that you've done with this, and I know we've talked about sleep, you know, what is a really important thing that people should keep in mind for being able just to be their better selves? I think the main thing is just to focus on hope. And by hope, I, I don't mean you hope that things will get better. It's more of a lifestyle. And it stems from positive thinking where self-care will bring you. So you have you're optimistic, you're positive, and you're filled with hope that your day is going to go well, that your interactions with people are going to be, be positive. People are going to be a, want to be around you. So I think the main take is do all these self-care tools and it will help rewire your brain and give you that attitude of hope. And we can all use that right now. <laughs> we need more hope. My goodness. It, it, yeah. you know, it, is this something that the schools are looking to put in effect and teach? Well, you know, it's kind of discouraging right now. And, you know, I have a lot of teachers in my family and they're struggling too, asking a lot. 
for teachers been teaching online. Uh, they're struggling, and it's really hard for them to be able to offer these self care tools to their students. You know, I think we need to start with our teachers first and parents, and get them dialed in, get them take caring for themselves. They can then serve as role models and be able to teach these to to their students. So my personal opinion is mental health needs to be a priority for everyone. And we've got to take care of our teachers. We've got to offer these tools to our parents and then also offer it to students starting at a young age. You know, don't wait till they're in college or, you know, or hope that they'll get these tools on their own. It just doesn't happen. It didn't happen for us. And it's not likely that that it's going to happen unless we make this a priority in our schools. Well, Christy, I really appreciate the time we've been able to spend talking about your book, Be You Only Better. Where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your work and be part of your community? Go to my website at thegriefgirl.com. Well, Christy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, Christy. You always bring such profound information, and I'm so grateful we were able to spend this time together today. Again, if you like to connect with Christy, you can at thegriefgirl.com for more information. There you can listen to her podcast, The Grief Girl, which has great information too. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.